All right, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter number 7 tonight. And we'll read seven verses in Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, beginning of verse 1, down through verse number 7, so we'll stand together for the reading of God's Word. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 1. says there, a good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise Amen. than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of the thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. And um, we'll stop right there. Let's ask the Lord for His blessing, and uh, we'll jump into the Word here. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank You for just uh, the privilege and the honor it is to be Your children. We thank You that we uh, just have the opportunity to assemble ourselves together tonight. Lord, I pray that You would um, just help us. This is a time of need, and we're a needy people. Uh, and Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from your word. Uh, just to, to have wisdom to live out the rest of, of this week. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us as we're in your word tonight. Help us to just be able to be a strength and a comfort to each other by our countenance, by our words tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just bless the preaching of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So there is a key phrase here in this paragraph, in this portion of Scripture. Uh, Solomon is going to use the word better again and again and again. And, uh, and a lot of these betters were in a question. So the, the title here of our study tonight is, What is Better Than What? A good name is better than ointment. Death is better than birth. Mourning is... Is better, mourning meaning sad, not mourning meaning the sun's rising. Uh, mourning, sorrow, mourning is better than feasting. Sorrow is better than laughter. And then rebuke is better than flattery. And so what is better than what? Uh, Solomon is going to say that the, um, the dour things of this life are going to be more to our benefit and also give us more uh, wisdom and endow us with more capabilities uh, than any of the good things that we might experience in life. We live in a great hedonistic culture, uh, and you know, we live in the lap of luxury here in America. I mean, we, people complain about the 1%. Well, I got news for you tonight. You are the 1%, okay? And so we live uh, better than a lot of kings did in the ancient world. Uh, and, you know, it is the last days, and we can travel to and fro about the face of the earth. And uh, most of our time is spent planning out our next luxury, our next vacation, our next trip. Uh, we're going to go here and there like Marco Polo and experience all these great uh, sights and things. And we're going to take a lot of selfies and post them to our social media. And look how great my life is, uh, right? And um, <laughs> Solomon says that does absolutely nothing for your life, and in fact, it makes it worse. Uh, and it doesn't do anything to make you wise. It doesn't do anything for your heart. What is good for the exterior in your joy and, and uh, being a hedonist and an American glutton of pleasure uh, is actually going to be to the detriment of your soul. Uh, so what you actually learn in sorrow and also in suffering is going to make your life better now and then also your life better someday 
in eternity. Uh, most people who God has used traumatically, uh, God has also caused them to experience a great suffering and great sorrow. And we're going to get into that tonight. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, God has never fully used a man until he has fully broken him in pieces. Uh, and God makes us moldable vessels through uh, trials and through afflictions. Uh, this is a quote from Dr. John Henry Jowett, and he was considered one of the greatest preachers in the English-speaking world. Uh, he said this, You seem to imagine that I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy and equanimity. By no means, I have often perfectly wretched and everything, I, I am often perfectly wretched, he says, and everything appears most murky. So he says, uh, I know I've been a blessing to very many people and probably people as they read my works and provide, uh, provide them comfort, uh, they think that I have never had a bad day in my life. Uh, actually, the opposite is true. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, I am the subject of depressions of spirits so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon, probably the most quoted uh, Christian of all times, uh, says that he had deep and dark valleys. Um, one of the things that's prized by Solomon uh, one of the things that uh, God uses him to tell us to search for and to seek for uh, and to seek and the price and the value is far above gold, silver, precious rubies, precious stones is wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all that getting, get understanding. He says, so sell all that you have and seek after Wisdom. Wisdom is what you want in life. And wisdom is when you uh, experience God through His Word. Uh, wisdom is when you rightly apply the Word of God to your life. Uh, remember Solomon's time for every season? Uh, there, you know, turn, 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 remember? Uh, and we said wisdom is knowing what season of life you are in uh, and rightly applying the Word of God to the season in which you're in. Uh, and knowing how to behave in that season. So what he's going to teach us here in these seven verses is that you are going to rightly learn wisdom. You're not going to learn it in the house of feasting. You're actually going to learn wisdom in the household of sorrow. And any time that you're having a bad time, it is your opportunity to gain wisdom and to gain learning and understanding. Uh, and so... Let's look at a few things here tonight. Verse number one, uh, we spoke about our good name in Christ Jesus last week. We had 12 names, 12 of the many names that were given as Christian. And he says a good name is better. A good name is better than precious ointment. And precious ointment at this time was a very high value. Uh, remember uh, the lady who broke the vessel and poured and anointed uh, Jesus there that it was... Uh, precious spikenard that was worth a year's salary. This is one of the ways that you would store up your treasures. You buy precious ointment. Another thing about ointment is that uh, it smells nice. Uh, and it is a good thing to smell nice, you know? Yeah. And um, remember uh, Jim Goss. Every time, you know, ta you know Italian, so uh, he's one of the, the guys that uh, would always kiss me when I come to church. You know, he'd come up and give me a nice hug and a nice kiss. One thing I did appreciate about uh, Jim Goss is that he always smelled very nice. I mean, he's always fresh aftershave before he came to church. So, I mean, if I'm going to get kissed by a guy, he better smell nice, you know. Uh, and so he'd come in here, and uh, it was precious ointment. He had a fragrance. He had a, an aroma uh, about him. And I really believe this is what Solomon is, is speaking to. He says a good name, a person with a good character, a good characteristics, uh, has the same idea as a precious ointment or a fragrance is, uh, is that when you are around this person, uh, that they carry with them the aroma 
of a good name. Here were some of the names that were given to us uh, by our new birth. Remember, uh, one of the things that the uh, Holy Spirit is attributed to is anointing. And you read about the anointing yep. oil of the Old Testament. It was a fragrance that would uh, fill up the place. Uh, and so here was uh, some of the names we went over last week. Here's the names that you were given when you're born again into God's family. Uh, we are sons of God. We're brethren. We are saints. We are Christians. Uh, we are Christ's disciples, ambassadors, fishers of men. We're soldiers. We're sheep. We're stewards. We're servants. We're kings. And we are priests. And think about people who have a good name in Christ Jesus. They are a refreshment to uh, see, and they're a good person. I looked up several cross, but we have five points, and I'm not going to read a bunch of verses. But um, uh, there's different people in the Bible that are spoken of uh, that have a good name, and they are, have a good name, and they will bring a good report. And so there's uh, a good name that is even better than precious ointment. When you have a good name, people are uh, delighted to see you. You're a refreshment to them. Uh, you invigorate their, their uh, spirit and their heart. Uh, and uh, you bring with you uh, everything that a good name uh, brings. So a good name is better than ointment. And then I want you to notice the second part of that verse. And it says, in the day of death than the day of one's birth. So the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. Now it does say in the Bible this. Psalms 116 verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. That's a precious day in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Uh, in Philippians 1.23, Paul says this. I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far, what's the next word? Better. So he agrees with Solomon there that um, your death day is better than your birthday. And uh, here's Hebrews eleven sixteen. He says, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Uh, so previous to this, we had uh, Bible doctrines class. We're going over judgment, going over words, uh, speaking about a good name, and um, speaking about choosing the right things and choosing wisdom. Uh, it's 2nd Danny's 20th anniversary tonight. Not awesome? In church, in the household of God. He even called me earlier today to clarify, should I go to church on my anniversary? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an awesome question? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you know, um, when you involve the Lord in your marriage, it's a whole lot, uh, whole lot better than the alternative. And uh, I, and I, I said, that, you know, the, the majors. You were at the, um, you were at the pavilion prayer meeting. I said that it was a major's anniversary Saturday, and guess where they were at? On their anniversary, they were at a prayer meeting praying together. Uh, is you know, isn't that a good? Isn't that better? Uh, and it's better than. You know, uh, and so a good name is better. And then the day of death is better than your birthday. Uh, and here's one of the reasons why is that when you make it to the end and you die, that seals up your testimony uh, and and your good name is gone with you. And just think about the different saints of God that we've been able to say goodbye to. Uh, and we still hold them in our hearts. They're still a testimony before, for us. They've gone on before us. Uh, but we can still uh, praise and thank the Lord for them. And there's still different people. You know, we're uh, praying for uh, somebody at the pavilion prayer meeting. And one of the things that automatically brought up us just thinking and praying for them at that prayer meeting, I was like, Lord, you know their father in a testimony of their father and how their father loved you. Now do that for their father's sake. I can't pray that for everybody's children, okay? Uh, but that man, not to say his name since we're on live stream, uh, has a good name, so I'm praying for his children. And the Bible says wisdom is justified by her children, okay? So when you die, your, name, your good name is sealed. And we know there is some things that we can lose in this life. And one of those things that we can lose is our good name. Uh, it says in 2 John that we're to beware lest at any time we should lose our reward. And so we know that certain rewards uh, can be lost. Uh, so the day of death is better because if we, man, if we go out in the saddle, 
both guns ablaze and for the Lord. And that's the way I want to, we got uh, Brother Tom Lancaster coming to preach uh, at uh, Missions Conference this fall. And I love him because he's like 85 years old. I've known him for at least 10 years. Um, he's passionate about the Lord's work. He's also passionate about fishing, too. I like that. Uh, Brother Paul and I were fishing with him, and he fell, in, he fell in the Salmon River, right? You know, he's not too stable, you know, being up in his 80s out in that river. Uh, but he wanted to catch himself a big fish. Uh, but one of the things I love and appreciate about him is he's not, uh, he's not just looking in the past and all he's done for the Lord. Man, he's, he's still looking out the front windshield. Right? They say that's why your rearview mirror is only like this big and the windshield's this big. Yeah, it's because you're just supposed to go driving full throttle all the way into the kingdom of God uh, and keep on looking forward. And here's the exciting thing about the Christian life is that we have nothing but gain when we die. When we die, it is, Paul said, far better. It's not that I'm going to a better place. And so in this life, Ernie, you know you're as close to hell is you're ever going to get right now. Amen. And if you're not saved, you're as close to heaven as you'll ever get. And so there's a day coming that is better than even your birthday. That is the day of your death. Number three, so we see a good name is better than ointment. Death day is better than birthday. Uh, number three, mourning is better than feasting. Look at verse number uh, two. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Um, I've never seen anybody saved at a wedding. Maybe you have. I've never seen anybody get saved. People are there to feast. But I've seen plenty of people go and see the corpse of a loved one and their heart is made wiser at that house of mourning. And they realize, as Solomon said, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for it is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. And that's why preachers say, I've, heard, I've never heard the alternative, but I've heard so many preachers say, I'd much rather preach a funeral than a wedding. I mean, a wedding's just a show. Uh, but man, at a funeral, we are doing business. This is serious time here where we are looking mortality in the face and you and I must too go this way. Uh, and, and here uh, in the house of mourning, uh, one thing that we'll find is that we have, and especially with someone that you love, you have a, a sad face, but you have a happy heart because you know that death is not final, and we have a home again. And those Amen. who die in Christ Amen. Jesus, we get to see them again someday. Um, turn, if you will, to Luke chapter number 13. Luke chapter number 13. Here's one of the great questions of mankind. Uh, now, we live in a new era. I was just um, reading about how the ancient man, like today, you know, uh, one of the questions is every time there's a tragedy, let's say there's a tsunami or it's 9-11 or uh, there's some sort of mass shooting or some sort of tragedy, um, if, if there is a God, how could there be so much suffering in the world? Um, and this is actually a modern phenomenon where mankind would ask this of God. If you read any of the ancient literature, they just figured that God was probably smarter than they were and God probably had a reason for suffering. Okay, uh, and guess what? God is smarter than you and is smarter than me, and there is a reason for suffering. Um, Jesus was confronted with um, the same thing in his day and age. In Luke chapter number 13, he's going he's gonna to be asked about uh, an atrocity committed by Pontius Pilate. So remember that when Pontius Pilate crucified Christ, he said, I find no fault in this man. I wash my hands of him. I will not have anything to do with, uh, his wife says, don't have anything to do with this just right. man. Um, but he was under political pressure. He had already made a few boo-boos in the land. Uh, and one of the things that he did, one of the great atrocities, uh, was there was Galileans, political enemies from the north. They went into the temple and he sent the Roman guard, Gentiles, into the temple and killed Galileans there. And it says that their blood mixed with the blood of the sacrifices there right in the temple. So it was a great atrocity. 
So fellow believers were killed in the temple. Uh, and then there's another question. Here's a natural disaster. Um, the Tower of Shalom. We don't know exactly what that was. Probably a tower off an aqueduct or something. Uh, you go over there today, you see, still see aqueduct systems left over when the Romans occupied the land. Uh, you can still see them standing today. But um, those who, the Tower of Shalom fell. So look at this, Luke 13. There was present that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jews answering said unto them, suppose, and, I'm sorry, and Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that the Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Shalom fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So here's Christ's answer to natural tragedy or some sort of atrocity, some sort of mass, mass murder. He says, you think the, those Galileans that died there in the temple were worse than the other Galileans? Or do you think those that were um, down in Jerusalem that died, the Tower of Shalom fell on them and killed them? you think they were worse than the others? I tell you, nay, no. Here was the message from God to you. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. God speaks to us through tragedy, letting us know that this life is only temporary, and so we should be living for the next life, the one to come. So mourning is better than feasting. The next portion, we're, we're in, the, in the New Testament here. And I tell you what, turn to... Never mind. Okay. Turn, turn back to your text. Look, look, at, uh, look back at Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. And then we're going to jump to um, 2 Corinthians. But um, so Solomon says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And so, sad face, happy heart, verse number 3. Um, 2 Corinthians 6.10 says this, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And, and so there, there's many things, many things that there, there's going to be sorrow over, in this world. Remember, we live in a corrupt and dying system. The wages of sin is death. And that's the death of each and every one around us. Um, that we know ultimately that uh, we're going to say goodbye on this earth to everyone that we love. And uh, so it says that the heart of the wise is in the heart of mourning and, and, and understands our own mortality. And because of this, our heart is made wiser, but at the same time, in the sorrow, uh, there is wisdom and there can be joy. So verse number three again, sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, uh, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Now, look, if you will, to 2 Corinthians and look at chapter number one. Chapter what, one? Yes, sir. Chapter number one. Second Corinthians chapter number one. So it says there, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith 
we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth in Christ. There's two words there that, uh, that stick out in this text. One is comfort, the God of all comfort, who is able to comfort us. If we're in the house of feasting, there's no need of comfort. There's only one place that you're going to get supernatural comfort from God, uh, the supernatural peace that passes all understanding. It is going to be in the household of sorrow, in the household of mourning, uh, in the household of pain. And so Paul is going to write in one of the most comforting letters in the Bible, and that's 2 Corinthians. Uh, and he's going to talk about the tribulation that he is in and how that he personally experienced supernatural comfort. Uh, and he says this supernatural comfort and anything that God gives you is not for you alone. It's also for other people. Uh, you know, my cup runneth over, you know, so we have an overflow, a supernatural overflow from God. And so when we go through suffering, we go through trials, uh, and, uh, and we do go through some sort of pain, it, God is going to comfort you with a supernatural comfort, and that comfort that you're going to get through this trial and this tribulation is not going to be for you alone. It is going to be so that you can help other people. Um, you know, one of the things that you're told, you know, in, you know, in, in preaching class or learning how to preach, if you preach to hurting people, you'll never lack for an audience. Uh, you know, that, that is true uh, for all Christians who want to be a blessing. That really, a lot of times, the, the Christians who are the greatest blessing have gone through the most amount of suffering and pain. And so we say, through suffering and pain, there's two options. You can either get bitter or you can get better. So you can use what happened to you as a stumbling block or you can use it as a stepping stone. Uh, you, can, you can use it as an obstacle or you can use it as an opportunity to get closer to the Lord. So he says here in verse number four, here's the comfort and then next is the consolation. To console someone or, or consolation has to do with come alongside. Jesus Christ was a great comforter. Um, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, he weeps over the city of Jerusalem. Uh, reading my Bible reading this morning, he, he, we're, he's, he's carrying a cross. And the women, the women are weeping for him. He says, weep not for me. Mm -hmm. Weep for yourselves. Jesus wept at uh, the funeral for Lazarus. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Uh, you know, you see the Old Testament prophets. Um, a lot of times the prophets will say, for instance, Malachi says the burden of Malachi. Many times a prophet talks about their own prophecy as their burden. There's a weight that God had placed in their life. And they were going to use this weight in their, their life to minister uh, to other people. And uh, here the Apostle Paul says in verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So we receive comfort, and we receive comfort for ourselves and for other people. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So... I'm suffering, Paul says, and it's for your benefit. Um, and it says, and whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Um, let me read this to you. This is Charles Spurgeon. He said, um, one Sabbath morning, I preached from the text, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And though I did not say so, yet I preached my own experience. I heard my own chains clank while I tried to preach to my fellow prisoners in the dark. But I could not tell why I was brought into such an awful horror of darkness, for which I condemned myself. On the following Monday evening, a man came to see me who bore all the marks of despair upon his countenance. His hair seemed to stand upright, and his eyes were ready to start 
from their sockets, he said to me after a little parlaying, I never before in my life heard any man speak who seemed to know my heart. Mine is a terrible case, but on Sunday morning you painted me to the life and preached as if you had been inside my soul. By God's grace, I saved that man from suicide and led him into gospel light and liberty, but I know I could not have done it if I had not myself been confined to the dungeon in which he lay. I tell you the story, brethren, because you sometimes may not understand your own experience, and the perfect people may condemn you for having it, but what know they of God's servants. You and I have to suffer much for the sake of people of our charge. You may be in Egyptian darkness, and you may wonder why such a horror chills your marrow, but you may be altogether in the pursuit of your calling and be led of the Spirit to a position of sympathy with desponding minds. You know, I am not an empathetic person. If I took a spiritual gifts test, I scored very low on empathy. <laughs> Amen, Laura. I might have a little Viking blood in my, myself, too. But I'll tell you something. If I'm going through something hard, I have empathy then. I feel what you're going through. I have pains of my own. And, uh, and, and let, let me tell you what has helped me through my pain. Let me tell you what verses I've claimed that has helped me. Uh, let me tell you how, what God has done for me in the darkness. Uh, and so he, he says there that uh, you're, you're going to go through darkness and you are going to be made wise through darkness. Again, remember, the most important thing in this life uh, that you're supposed to sell all things and obtain, and that is wisdom, to rightly know how to apply God's word to your life. Uh, and you are going to get this wisdom not in a house of feasting. You are going to obtain this feasting in uh, the in the house of mourning. Last thing he's going to say, we're not going to turn back to our text yet. Uh, since we're in 2 Corinthians, look at chapter number 7. One last place we're going to turn to, we'll turn back to our text and then we'll be done. Um, Solomon is going to say, it is, it is better to... Uh, be rebuked by a wise man. Again, you're going to be rebuked by all sorts of people. I mean, I've had all sorts of people telling me how worthless I am. Uh, but but uh, if it's somebody who is a wise person, then I take it to heart. Like, whoa, okay. So sometimes a wise person is going to rebuke you. Uh, and faithful are the wounds of a friend, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so if someone is wise, they know God, they know his word, and they're saying, hey, Jack, you better straighten up, buddy. Uh, and, and, and they get out. You better take heed. Uh, so someone who would rebuke you is going to be your friend, especially a wise man who rebukes you. Uh, it's better than the song of fools. Uh, so here, here's what Psalm's going to say. It's better to go to uh, you know, a revival preaching service where someone gets in your face and points their finger at you and preaches to you God's yep. word yep, and go hear the song of fools, like go to a rock concert or something. You know? uh, and then he says, talks about flattery, that it, you know, gift blinds the minds of the just. And so someone who wants to, um, you know, get something out of you, going to tell you how wonderful you are. Uh, a flatterer tells you what, a flatterer, especially someone who's really good, they figure out what you want to hear about yourself, and then they're going to tell you what you want to hear about yourself uh, so they can take you uh, uh, and, and, and deceive you. Uh, and so he's going to say open rebuke is better. Now look, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And look at verse number 7. Let's look at verse number 7. 2 Corinthians 7, 7. Um, and not by his coming only, talking about Titus coming, uh, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. 1 Corinthians I think if you've been reading the Bible for a little while, you know that the church in Corinth was the most problematic church. And so Paul, by the Holy Spirit, takes the Corinthian church to the woodshed. And it's rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. This is called the severe letter in theology is 1 Corinthians. I mean, he really goes after the Corinthian church. So Titus 
comes to Paul and comforts him, and he says, you know, back at Corinth, they are mourning. They are in sorrow. Uh, and, and notice um, what he says. He says in verse number 8, For though I, I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle that hath made you sorry, though it were for, but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorrow, sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In prodigal son... Peter, David, others, godly repentance. Someone came, rebuked them. They were sorry over their sin. They made it right. So turn back to our text. We'll read over this and then we're done. So Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 5, it says there, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of of fools. For as a crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. So think about your life for a moment. Remember that a good name is better than precious ointment. Better to have a good, godly, Christian character, be anointed by the Holy Spirit, have the fragrance of your godly name with you than to have a precious physical ointment. Remember that your death day is better than your birthday. I mean, I'm, you know, an old saying, uh, if I knew where I was going to die, I never would go there. Uh, you know, um, none of us are excited to get out of here. Uh, you know, it is scary to die because we've never done it before. Uh, but all the promises of the Bible, we know that, that's, that's, that we've got a good day coming. We'll be more alive on our death day than we ever were on our birthday. Uh, then remember this, is that mourning. could be in mourning tonight. Mourning is better than feasting. Remember, sad countenance, happy heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, verse number three. And then verse five says, rebuke is better than then flattery. So why don't you give yourselves a hug tonight and look yourself in the mirror and say, I am a, one, I am a winner. I am a hero. Uh, no, rebuke is better than flattery. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you just for uh, the wisdom of Solomon. And we thank you that we just have the privilege of holding uh, this precious book in our hands and going over this wisdom, going over this uh, sermon uh, from the wisest man who ever lived. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to uh, just uh, to under, understand just the wisdom that we received tonight. Uh, some things are better than others. And Lord, we thank you uh, just for this understanding. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us tonight. Give us a safe trip home. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so if, if you can give us a hand setting up tables, we would appreciate that. We want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.